really want this dog. And, um, you know, I'm very hesitant to have a dog because you know who ends up taking care of the dog. It's just it's me, right? Like, I'm going to be the one walking the dog, feeding the dog. And uh, I already have two kids, so I don't need an extra, you know, uh, serious. But I think I finally found a dog that I give the girls, you know. And it's not Henry, it's Ivo. And uh, it's amazing. Like, Ivo actually does a lot of things that dogs do. And I like how they kind of have this puppy dog face here at the end. I was like, girls, don't you want this dog? Um, but, uh, but yeah, enough joking around. Let's talk about something serious, right? And uh, what more serious than games, right? So AI has been beating us badly at games for years, right? It started with chess, and that wasn't really anything to do with AI. That was more of a brute force kind of approach. Uh, Jeopardy, that, that was pretty interesting. I like Jeopardy. I sit in front of the, mach the, uh, the TV here and there to said the machine, right? It is kind of like that machine that controls us all. Um, and, and, and watch Jeopardy and, and, you know, start to feel like smart or very dumb depending on how this goes. Uh, but it's impressive to start to see these machines uh, go at it. Um, ancient Chinese game of Go, that was a, a big breakthrough uh, that we're seeing these machines now step from being brute force and, and now using um, something that looks a little bit more like human intelligence to solve problems. And there's one more that doesn't get mentioned. I don't know if anyone, anyone knows who this is by any chance or what game he's playing. What game is that? Uh, it looks like Pac-Man, but it's not Pac-Man. It's actually Miss Pac-Man. But let's see. So there's, there's audio here. I don't know if you hear the audio visual. Did we lose the audio? So Abner Ashman, 933,580 points at Miss Pac-Man. Uh, I don't know, I think that's pretty impressive. But that, that was actually very close to what is actually the maximum score you can get at that game. And, uh, you know, he was the, it's actually appropriate because we're in, we're in Dublin here, and that's the Guinness World Record that he held. Uh, but he doesn't hold that record anymore, you know. Unfortunately for him, AI beat him to that record. And, you know, Microsoft uh, purchased the company, and, and they've been using machine learning, and specifically uh, reinforcement learning, to solve these problems, right? And using the Atari version of the game, hit that max score. And so more and more we're seeing... AI solve these problems and, and kind of overcome and, and kind of beat uh, us as humans, right? And it's all because of machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence that really deals with the programming model, right? It deals with actually how do we get these machines to act without explicitly programming them, giving these very detailed step-by-step -step instructions. And as I mentioned, I have two girls, uh, Soraya, on the left and Mackenzie on the right. And, and it's amazing, like there's a lot of differences between how uh, we've instructed machines uh, in the past and how humans learn, right? And uh, my friend Jennifer Boney will call these, these are, are little humans, and these little humans actually belong to me. And uh, this is actually not the current state. This was a year ago, at Soraya's fifth birthday. Current state looks more like this. And you know, after you have the second child, you start to realize that there's something special going on here. Like, that second child is just watching the first child all the time. Everything that Soraya does, Mackenzie's watching. It doesn't matter whether we're eating breakfast or she's at gymnastics. And then Mackenzie wants to do everything that her sister does. So Mackenzie's learning by Soraya's example and then trying things, and sometimes it works out well, and sometimes it doesn't work out well. And so there's either severe crying or severe joy, right, on these ends of the spectrum. But the whole idea behind machine learning is that can we actually get machines, can we train artificial brains the way that we train human brains, right? Either by example or through that type of, you know, reinforcement learning where we get feedback and we either change our behavior. And so 
you'll usually see about three different categories of machine learning, supervised learning, where we kind of know that uh, data, that example, we know what it is, and we know the outcome, right? And we kind of learn that known pattern. Unsupervised learning, you don't really know about that particular uh, data, that particular outcome. You just kind of have this idea that these are features that I'm looking for, and you ask the machine to kind of group or categorize or cluster these things together, and we kind of can discover things that we didn't know. So we can discover these unknown patterns by using the machine to do so. And then reinforcement learning, which is that trial, trial and error, right? Where we're generating data through actions. And then once you find out that outcome, then you feed that back into the machine and it becomes better than it was before. And so a lot of these things that we talk about, a lot of these approaches, a lot of these techniques are founded on uh, you know, using different uh, machine learning approaches to achieve the goal. And so let's go back to that Pac-Man example really quickly and take a look at how this Maluba works. Maluba has developed an advanced reinforcement learning algorithm that beat the Atari game Miss Pac-Man and achieved the maximum possible score of 999,990 points, surpassing the best human score by 4x. No human or AI has ever achieved this score because of the complexity of the game and availability of limited lives. We perform well on the game by breaking it into many small problems with a separate reinforcement learning agent for each problem. On screen, we have a total of 163 agents, 154 for pellets, four for ghosts, four more for edible ghosts, and one for the moving large fruit. Each agent also has its own reward function. We give a small reward for eating a pellet a large reward for eating a fruit or a blue ghost, and a large negative reward if Miss Pac-Man gets eaten by a ghost. At each moment in time, all agents send their action preferences for the current game state to an aggregator, which selects the best action for Miss Pac-Man based on a weighted average of all preferences. By breaking up a problem in this way, it becomes easier to learn, as there are now many agents that learn many simple tasks instead of just one agent that needs to learn a very complex task. Here, the arrow represents the direction the agent wants Miss Pac-Man to move, and the size of the arrow shows the strength of its preference. The strength of the agent's action preferences are also visible on the heat map. Beyond Miss Pac-Man, this fundamental advancement in reinforcement learning can improve decision-making in complex settings, such as sales funnels, financial models, or robotics. So yeah, we're, we're seeing us use these uh, approaches reinforcement learning to solve very complex problems, right? So we're decomposing the problem using these agents, assigning them different rewards or penalties based on, on what happens. And, and it's been very, very successful. Uh, we're applying it to lots of, of hard problems, right? Like driving cars, like sitting in the back seat of a vehicle and letting it take over. And, and this is pretty scary. Uh, but it's also pretty cool at the same time to watch these machines. And these are the types of problems that it's hard to put together that detailed step-by-step -step algorithm for. And so AI is helping us to automate these things that we previously thought weren't possible or were you know, in our limited scope of what is possible. And so AI is stepping into areas that people are we're skeptical that it would ever achieve, like music. Uh, you know, the OpenAI project, there's an initiative that trains machine using examples and then doing some type of reinforcement learning as well to create music. And so AI can host a concert. And you can go check it out, go on the website, and AI can host a concert. And not only can it play and create music from different styles of artists, but it can mix these things together in very unique ways, right? And so this is a sample of the style of Adele that was created by Musnet. You can kind of hear, like, it sort of feels like Adele, right? But it's not Adele, it's Ed. And so you have to step back and start to think about what is really possible versus what is impossible. And so, we're not immune, right, in software engineering. There's also another project on the OpenAI initiative where they're looking at better language models and the different implications of these language models. 
and they're taking that and applying it to software development. Right? So this is AI giving you suggestions. And we've seen intelligent suggestions before in IDEs, but these aren't just suggestions based on what you start typing. These are actually suggesting the semantics of this program. So this program has been trained on string concatenation, and it's actually writing the program itself. And so it shouldn't be very hard for you to see that from here when we start talking about cats and video games and driving cars and music and now code. It should be easy for you to think that AI is now testing software. And it is. This technology is so generally applicable that we can apply it to almost any function. And so these are two solutions. One. Uh, that's an open source project by Ultimate Software. And uh, the other is a commercial product by Test.ai. And these are using these intelligent agents to explore the application from the user interface. Try things. It tries to log in and then it fails and then it tries again and succeeds. Uh, it's using testing techniques that we're familiar with, boundary value analysis and equivalence partitioning, to traverse through the application and give you feedback. And so, you know, when we see this number up here, you know, people get a little nervous when you see big numbers like that. I mean, the jobs are going to be replaced. Um, it's a real thing. It's real technology that's coming. And it's great to see, like, this community and this conference kind of be in front of that. And, and even from last year, which I, I wasn't even aware of. Uh, and so this is the time. And it seems this is also the place. So let's talk a little bit about how I kind of got into this particular space. Like we, in 2016, we had a moonshot project at Ultimate Software. Uh, and you know, with any kind of moonshot project, you need a lofty goal. And so the goal that we were hit with, we wanted to build a system, which we codenamed Pterodactyl. I, I don't know why that name, but now that looking at it, it sounds pretty cool. And the Pterodactyl system was supposed to help us find at least 25% of defects for any new product feature. And we needed to do that autonomously, completely free of input from human beings, right? No problem, right? Just 25% of defects, right? Piece of cake. And so we set out and we built a system. And we achieved uh, uh, quite a bit, right? Our system was capable of automatically discovering the states of an application and building this giant model. And this is an enterprise application or recruiting application. And this, these states represent a lot of the different pages within that, I mean, different widgets. And you can kind of filter down the model that big. Of course, you need to be able to scale down and filter. And then you can jump to <coughs> a particular state, and you can see what aspect of the application is being referenced at those lower levels. What specific widget are we looking at? And where does it lie on the page? Like the deep link for it. And which, which is it? So, so that was pretty cool just to be able to do that at that scale, right, for a large enterprise level application. And then, of course, it's no good if we can perceive it, but we can't actually generate tests and, and execute tests. And so we built a system that used, as we mentioned earlier, like different testing techniques and allowed us to, to really go through and report on things that we believe were defects and kind of run regressions on certain things and, and just kind of see what was going on. So. As you drill into this, you start to see some of the uh, testing techniques that we use, either state-based, boundary value analysis, equivalence partitioning, looking at different workflows through the system. And we needed to be able to, to see exactly what these intelligent agents were doing so we could drill down and kind of see the detailed test steps that were happening and you know the screenshots and everything. Right? And so that's good. We need to be able to have all that in place and very hard problem to solve and you see the tests look interesting and uh, you'll see something later that we'll talk about. We actually also were able to use it to kind of start to look at accessibility issues and to be able to, to look at those. And so, so far so good. It sounds like we're, we're making progress, right? And of course the last part of it was really trying to get the system to learn because it's one thing to explore an application and look at all the different states and look at what is there. But we all know from a quality perspective and a testing perspective, it's not about what is there. <coughs> it is about what should be there, right? And that's the hard part uh, about testing. 
um, understanding those requirements, right? And so we built something that could take the written requirements that we had, things that in Jira, and actually allow the you know business analysts to start to train the system to interpret and understand these requirements, right? And so give feedback, like, hey, how are you understanding this? This is good. No, this is really an uh, update statement. It's not about deleting anything and, and those kind of things, right? And so it's critical to go through this process if we're talking about truly automating testing, right? Uh, because testing in these days are, is very uh, manual, right? We talk about automated tests, but we are not automating a lot of this aspect of it the requirements and the understanding of the requirements and that stuff. We're usually talking about manually writing Selenium script and running it, and then the minute it fails, we have to kind of jump back in the picture. It's not very truly automated. And so it sounds good, it looks impressive, all fancy. But we had some key achievements there as well as some lessons learned, right, as, as with anything. Uh, we had a good foundation where we were playing and using a lot of machine learning algorithms and we had the testing methodologies in there which are tests that our, our human testers would write. Uh, we could explore this application, right, and just crawl through it. It was very extensible design at that point. And then just a lot of the things that we had around test execution and debugging and being able to see exactly what these agents were doing, that was a, a pretty uh, key aspect of it. And we could rerun tests and, and in line debug and go back to a particular spot because you know that's what we want to do. We want to find issues. We need to be able to kind of try to reproduce them. But there are some challenges. We realized that in doing this, um, we really didn't break it down as, as much as we could. We had still a very hefty system, which is why the word pterodactyl is important. Um, you know, we had agents, but they weren't at the same level as you saw in that Pac-Man game. They had agents, 184 agents, just even down to the pellet, right, uh, of what was going on there. Uh, we had it broken down into very large chunks, and so that led us to having a lot of memory issues and just having long-running processes to do discovery. It, it wasn't very efficient. Um, a lot of the functionality that we had there, uh, in terms of especially when it came to the Oracle problem, right, like solving what is the program supposed to do, kind of thing, and, and you know, that's not one of our goals was to find 25% of defects. Um, that, and obviously that is in comparison to maybe what a testing team would find. Um, that was hard, and then, you know, we were just kind of focused on those requirements when it came to training, and that was very limited source of knowledge, and so we needed to improve on our built-in user feedback. Uh, but it's fine, you know. You shoot at the moon and you hit a star, right? I mean, we learned a lot and there was a lot that came out of that. And again, up to this date, it feels like a very impressive system to look at. And um, the key to when you do a moonshot, regardless of your outcome, is to make sure that you learn from it, right? It's great to succeed, but success to me is also hey, you know what, I learned something and it was a negative result. And it's now what do I do with that negative result? And so we have to shift our focus. Shift our focus from having these agents be these very large grain things and really getting them to be more fine grain. And really leveraging this idea of having autonomous and intelligent agents that can do testing. And so this whole idea is... We want to be able to teach each of these agents how to test software and, and teach them like a human would, right? And so, yeah, we've got to ask some questions, like what is that application supposed to do? There needs to be some intent, and each agent needs to have that intent or that goal to understand what it's trying to achieve with this application because the application was built to accomplish some task. What does it look like? We knew that we needed to be able to perceive it. Instead of having a, a giant discovery process, we needed each agent to be able to perceive what it was looking at. We need to test different user scenarios, and the sequence of steps that are needed to actually accomplish that scenario. There's also different variations, right? We don't just test one single path, right? We look at multiple paths and hard branches out. And then that grueling Oracle problem, right? 
now that we've done all that, how do we really know that the application did what it was supposed to do and nothing else, right? And so this process of training bots is actually very similar to humans, right? It's the same way that we kind of learn to test. Uh, and, and that's what a lot of AI is. It's really about simulating what humans would do, right? How they would think. So the key to this, this whole idea of AI driven <coughs> testing or AIDT, is to know that machine learning is at the core of everything that you're doing, right? And it doesn't mean that the system needs to just be completely machine learning. No, like, of course, if there's tasks that are easily specified using a more procedural step-by-step -step approach, you solve it in that way. But for some of those harder things, yeah, machine learning gives you like a new tool in your toolbox to tackle those harder problems. And so we had to teach the bots to perceive and to explore. So somehow they needed to be able to look at that application environment and understand the structure of the user interface and the behavior uh, of, of that application, especially look at even differences over different builds. And so to do that, we can use a number of things. We can use images, right? There's a lot of work in AI around using images to train and uh, you know just recognize things. If we can recognize cats, we can certainly recognize widgets on the screen, right? Uh, but there's also a lot of information in the DOM, right? So just being able to scrape that object model or look at the computed render tree and have all that information. And then you can use different approaches to actually be able to classify each element on the screen, right? And so one of the things beyond that is that once you've built that mechanism for perceiving something, you want to make sure that you have models that help you remember those things. Right? Because models help us deal with uncertainty. You all walked into this room, the lights were on. If I reset, turned off the lights, and put you at that door and told you to make your way to the podium up here, you'd be able to do it, even in complete darkness. Because you built that model, and even though you have this partial observability at this point, you now are just relying on that model, and you can try to navigate this world, even though you can't see anything. And so the machines can do that, and so we build models for that purpose. A very important aspect of this is that test generation interaction. That requires us to make sure that we can generate inputs for the application. And we can also observe outputs and verify whether or not those outputs are correct. Right? And so you use machine learning here again. You use machine learning to generate different actions. The machine might, or the bot might try an action and you know, so they might pinch the zoom on this menu bar versus tap. And depending on what you're trying to teach the machine, you might just basically say, you know, good dog, bad dog, right? And so the machine can learn from those trial and action errors by reinforcing or rewriting that learning, similar to the agents in the game. So let's look at how this reinforcement learning looks by walking through an example, right? Like let's say we wanted to somehow reach the shopping cart to view our cart. And so our task is view cart. And then we look and we see, well, we're right now at the home page, right? The bot is at the home page. And it can start by trying some actions. You assign it a score of zero and say, hey, you know what? Go find this cart. And so it goes to the product page. And you're like, well, that's not where we want to go. So we're going to give you minus one, right? You didn't really do what we wanted to do, so we assign you some negative reward. And then it tries something else and then transitions and it finally reaches to that spot. So it's like, oh, this is where we want to be. We give it 100 points, right? And so we end up with a score of 99 through that trial and error action, right? Now if we reset this, and the agent is back at home base, we're back at a score of zero, and it tries, and boom found a better path, right? So by taking the problem of testing and modeling it similarly by assigning these rewards and these penalties, we can actually do some very interesting things with these bots. And the cool thing about this, there's a lot of layers to this, but the cool thing about this for me is that we could change the structure there. Like we could remove one of those links. You know what's going to happen if you remove one of those links? the bot is going to figure out a way to get to the destination. Just like when we change the application, right? When we change the application, we move the link, we move a button, and what happens? All of our tests break.
but AI isn't going to break. AI is going to say, well, okay, this is different, just like you would. This is different, so I'm going to change something. Let's try to figure out how to get towards our goal by trying different things. And this becomes possible with all the compute power that we have. So these bots, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit, remember I said I wanted to make sure that we demystify what this thing is all about, and that's really about getting onto the nitty gritty as to how this stuff works at a high level and then getting deeper. Uh, years ago, Microsoft had this architecture for their autonomic computing initiative where they described these loops, uh, control loops. I actually think a lot of that was a little bit before its time. Monitor, analyze, plan, execute. You've seen this in different forms, I'm sure. Um, so, so these agents kind of perform these functions, and they use knowledge and machine learning at the core of everything they do. And so you want to think of this as like, hey, maybe these machines are trained with some seated knowledge, right? There might be some supervised machine learning that happens, and they have some models already. Um, but now they can also acquire new knowledge. They can learn as the system is running. They get feedback and they, they learn. So they have to be able to maintain that existing knowledge and then share that knowledge amongst agents, right? The system only works if the agents can communicate and interact. And so this idea of make plus knowledge and machine learning. And to make it real, I want you to think, and we saw in the game that there was some coordination going on. You have an agent at the top that's somehow responsible for coordinating the testing process. And there's these worker level agents beneath, right, that are interacting with the application. And these agents are autonomous, right, so they can act independently. So they're on different aspects of the application. And they can do a lot of things, right? And the sole purpose of the agent at the top is to just to make sure that he can manage these lower level workers. Seems like how we organize ourselves as humans or as organizations or as societies, but uh, I don't know. depends on who's at the top, right? So, so these agents, these worker level agents, can be in different modes. One of the modes there at the center is to be able to explore the application and start to generate tests. And so we're going to start in that mode, and these agents are going to start looking at the application, different parts of it, and generating <coughs> tests using AI. Right, trying different actions or at least outlining these are the actions I would try. And when you're doing this, obviously like there can be some duplication. So you want that top level agent to be looking at, before we start to distribute any of these jobs, to be looking at that queue of generated tests and maybe doing things like deduplicating them, right? Like this, these two things are the same, let's not do these. And then, and then it will get into the process of distributing it to different agents for execution. And so each of these agents, these worker level agents, again, autonomously, can receive some of these jobs. And then it can say, okay, well, now I'm ready to switch my mode from exploration to one of test execution. And so the two agents at the end switch their mode to be able to actually execute these tests. And the agent in the middle, he's still going about doing test generation, right? And so you have this very complex system where you have all of these agents kind of crawling the application, communicating with each other, running tests, and generating test results, and continuing to do all of that all at the same time. Now, this is just three. Probably because of the slides, I couldn't do more than three, right? Plus, I would lose you. Um, but imagine this at scale. It's very powerful. Even if these agents aren't very smart, there's lots of them, right? And we all know lots of semi-intelligent things can be very, very powerful. So we actually don't need the machines to be ever so smart to get a lot of value from it, right? And we'll talk about that. So the cool thing is that this is not just some cool animation that I'm showing you. This is actually the behavior of an open source project that we released, right? That that uh, thing that I showed you in the, in the beginning with ultimate software and test AI and the bots running. This, this is this project. It's actually two pieces of the project. One is called Agent, which is that uh, AI generation and exploration and test. And Agent X is kind of the, the eyes of the project, right? It's a Chrome plugin that allows you to train these bots and see, 
got to look into how they're uh, looking at things. So you can go there and look at that, you know, star us, download it, fork it, like just do whatever you want and just make it better. And the goal of this, and this is not a complete pterodactyl system, this was just some output from our lessons learned where we built this new prototype, right? And so by no means a production ready system for you to just point at and use. The purpose of this is exactly what you see me doing here, which is less of me talking and presenting wonderful animations and more speaking with code and contributing that to the community because that's how our ideas take flight, right? By sharing and sharing something tangible that people can look at, run, etc. right? And so now you can understand what's going on here, right? You can understand that there's a, a test coordinator and some agents over here and you can see that and you can download it, look at the code, you don't have to believe me, don't believe anything I say, we're all skeptical people in here, right? We're all quality minded people, we don't believe anything anyone tells us. And go play with it yourself. So, and then this is Agent X, this is also pretty cool, the Chrome plugin. You can just kind of use that to analyze a, a given page and kind of walk through and figure out what's going on. And not only can you see what the bots are seeing, but now you can also train them, right? You can go and say, well, you didn't notice that this thing over here was a, a, a commit button, right? A submit button. So let's go and train it and redo this, right? So it's incredible, right? That we are able to kind of get to this point where we can build these types of tools. Um, and we learned a lot from our lessons, and one of our lessons was that functional testing was weak, and so we needed some more sources of knowledge. And one of the things that Diony Santiago, who's a principal quality architect at Ultimate Software, did as part of his master's thesis was look at different approaches to teach machines to test like humans, right? And to learn from the artifacts that we produce, mainly uh, tests. And he got the idea from, uh, some work in AI that someone was doing around text generation. And they were looking at classical text like Alice in Wonderland, and they were using these long short-term memory machines and recurrent neural networks to have the AI like write stories, right? Sounds kind of interesting. So he was looking at it. And so, you know, in, in terms of this, like it analyzes the book, right? Looks at all those characters in the book, pulls out the distinct characters. And what it would do, it would create a training set that took um, some subsequence, right? Let's say here are the subsequences of length five. And it would look at the first five characters of a particular sequence and say that this five, um, this um, subsequence of length five maps to the next letter, right? So it's just saying if you see this, then this is the next letter. And it broke up the data like that and just trained the entire set using that. And, well, this is what it kind of looked like. So normally with these systems, you kind of see some text from the actual book, and then you let the AI go. And so this was just using one hidden layer, it would generate this text. Not so great, looks kind of weird, not very legible. But then, after using two hidden layers, we start to see it get better, right? So still nothing that you can read, right? But it certainly looks better than before. And that's the whole key here, is that AI might suck at first. And that's okay. It's okay to we suck at first, <laughs> right? But it learns over time. And so Diony looked at that and said, you know what? I think I can take our testing. Instead of looking at um, individual characters, I can just break up words into tokens and have each word represent some test sentence, right? And so for example, like here, if we observe a required text box first name on an application, and when we actually input some action, right? So we input a blank first name and invoke submit, then we expect to observe an error message, right? And so that's pretty cool because what we can do by taking that, we can create our training set and start mapping. We can say if we see observe, then we need to generate required and we can kind of train our, our, our net like that. And what the only start to notice is that when we start doing that, we can actually see the application with a substring which represents our preconditions, and then the system starts to generate 
And so we saw some history happen where the testers are now pairing with the bots and collaborating with them to generate tests. And so when you look at this, let's take that same pet clinic application, and this behavior is actually part of the agent prototype, so you can see how we did that as well. Um, you know, we start to look at an application, and we have this sentence, observe text box first name. We can now ask the model to start generating text, right? We will generate a blank, right? And we'll have this behavior that we expect. So now we can get the oracle tagged onto that, and then we can keep generating and get different tests every single time, right? We can use special characters. We can keep going in that manner. And so now the machine and the human are collaborating on tests. And so Dionne actually won a best paper presentation for our paper at that conference, the Pacific Northwest Software Quality Conference. So you can check that out. Uh, also part of his master's <coughs> thesis. And I'll try to make sure you guys have links to all that stuff. And this is Keith Briggs. This year at the PNSQC conference, Keith actually extended a lot of Dionne's work to do accessibility testing, right? So there's a play on the word ally, right? Accessibility. And uh, it's pretty cool because that framework that allows us to explore the application is actually very powerful. We can start adding on things like Axe or Lighthouse to let us do accessibility and performance testing using that same agent-based framework. So it's a very powerful, powerful thing. And then there's my buddy Jason Arbin. He's the CEO of Tesla AI. We've been doing a lot of this work together. We actually teach a course on it a master class on AI for testing. Um, and this is about the day that we saw the AI beat human testers, right? You know, we are always talking about AI beating humans. Well, it beat humans in this case where we asked the question of how would you determine if a mobile application login was trustworthy just by looking at it? And in a room probably twice as big as this, folks were like, ah, I don't know. They took a long time spinning their wheels. And then eventually they came up uh, and this is a sample of some of the applications that uh, the machine was able to kind of classify. And we showed them this, and they still were a little bit clueless. And eventually they said, hey, you know what? Well, I think if I saw a familiar brand, that would be something that I would tag on to. Or, or maybe if the language matches the region for the application, that would also be uh, another factor. And then that was it. After 70 testers for seven minutes came up with this answer, versus one bot in three seconds, because we run this experiment and train the machine just on those examples, right? And so you kind of see the AI is simulating this human judgment, and then we can inspect the model, and upon inspecting the model, we found another characteristic, right? And apparently, like, the fewer screen elements you have on that login page, the more trustworthy it is. And so we as testers learn from the AI. Yes, the AI beat us, but we also learned something new from it. And so one of the things with this is that you ask that question, is this trustworthy? And that's usually one of those very uh, qualitative questions. And humans come back with a qualitative answer, like, eh, it seems trustworthy. But now the machines are actually able to give us more of a numerical answer. Well, it's in the 90th percentile of all the trustworthy apps that I have in the model. And that becomes something that's very powerful for us to make that judgment. Usability testing, AppliTools, I think it's one of the sponsors here. Uh, they're doing visual testing, so we're able to automate things like usability testing and user design. Just feed it examples, train it on examples, and can tell you that this is intuitive, this is not intuitive. Those are things that we previously couldn't automate or were very difficult to automate. So there's lots of vendors out there now trying to push the envelope on this. And I gave a talk in Malaysia, uh, AI-driven testing, five fiction or future. Uh, one of them is in your backyard. I hope to meet with the CEO today at DiffBlue. They're doing something that's very different, like doing unit test generation using AI. But I encourage you to talk to these vendors and figure out, see what they're doing, and kind of follow them and keep pace, because this stuff is moving very, very quickly. All right, so time to wrap this up. There's a lot of interesting things here. You've seen a lot of these benefits, like applying AI to several different types of testing, any application domain. It's also what I like to call pesticide-free, where it's not running the same type of tests over and over again, right? This pesticide paradox. It's generating new tests, and that's very valuable to us. And then it's very large scale, right? Deep learning, the cloud infrastructure. 
And a big aspect of this is also reuse, right? We can rerun the same tests across different apps within a domain. And we can also start to think about reusing all the test data. Um, my friend Jason Arvin has an initiative, opentestdata.org, which is like this tester's home to upload free test data and get free test data. What better test data than to have like someone who's an expert in that domain contribute that? Like UPS or FedEx has all the addresses that we could want to think about. Why do we need to recreate that? And so there's definitely a lot of reuse. But Oh, and there's also a lot of robustness also going on. So there's another open source project. You've probably seen it, heard of it. Uh, just kind of getting a brain for Appium, right? So my buddy Jason hooked up with Jonathan Lips, who's the creator of Appium, and created uh, AI-driven element locators, right? So no more CSS collect selectors, just kind of a little bit more stable using AI to do that, right? And so you'll see things looking like this. Find a shopping cart, and it's being trained on thousands of images of shopping carts, right? But there's a few limitations, right? And there's something that's very big, and I think you're talking about it here at this conference as well, which is that how we traditionally have built programs has been to take input, create that program, and generate the outputs, right? Now we're building systems in such a way that we have the input and the output, and the system, AI, is kind of approximating that function. And every time we put that input in there and train the system <coughs> on given outputs, we actually change that function. Right? That's not a new function. So we talked about non-determinism, but there's a, a big part of it that's also about being adaptive. Right? That system is now a new system, and if we changed our program, we would need to rerun testing. And so the machines now need to go to a place where if we're doing this type of dynamic behavior at runtime, we need to be testing them at runtime. And that's where a lot of my passion is. My, I have a PhD that focuses on this area. And it's just about these systems need to now be able to test themselves. Because we can't have all this self-configuration, self-healing, all these properties without having the core be a self-testing mechanism. To do all this stuff at runtime, you need to be testing it at runtime. And really, you need bots that are inside the software testing the agents that are adapting the software. And so, you know, I, I usually tend to be one step ahead of the forward thinkers, so it's good that I found the forward thinkers here. Because for me, like these two areas of AI-driven testing and using AI within testing, and then testing AI systems is key, but there's also another area that we need to focus on, and that's how do we build the systems to have testing embedded as part of their function. And so, it's great to see a community rallying around the upper two boxes. Um, and I, I think next year you might be starting to look at that third box. So uh, a little preview of the future. Because the way that we get there, honestly, is through community. And so it's great to hear that this is not a conference. This is a community. Because I believe that this problem of AI for testing and testing AI systems is just too important, too large of a problem for any one individual or any one company to solve. Um, and so we ourselves, my friend Jason Arvin and myself, started an organization just around that, uh, AITesting.org, just a place for us to share information and get together. And so I get to come up here and talk about all this stuff, but really and truly, like, there's teams and teams of people. There's a, a community behind a lot of this stuff that we did, and this is just an acknowledgement for them. And uh, I want to leave you with this. You know, you guys are here. You trusted me to open this conference. Um, and really, that's all it is. This is just the opening. This is just the beginning. Uh, really, what happens next is up to you guys. So enjoy the conference. Share ideas. Open your minds. And then contribute to this great community that you're starting. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll just repeat the question for people who might not have heard it. He's asking about 
a key part of this is training the machine to understand the permanence. And he's asking, like, how did I, well, not I, but how did we manage to embark on that? And did we do any kind of natural language cross? And yeah, yeah that's exactly what we did. We, we actually hired a, a guy from, um, he worked at IBM for many years. He had over 200 pilots. And his thing was NLP. <laughs> um, and, and he did a phenomenal job at some of those things and some of those strikes. Of course, not everyone can afford an NLP expert. Uh, but actually looking back at it, not that we didn't need him, he was a, a great contribution to get it done fast. Uh, there's just a lot of work out there on natural language processing. And so usually what we found is a lot of this stuff has been not necessarily that uh, testing is ever so unique of a problem or whatever, but just finding that mapping between some of the existing research and what we're trying to achieve, and, and we're using that knowledge. And there's a lot of that stuff out there uh, if you start to think about it, the requirements piece is just kind of one of them. But the whole, the whole idea of testing is right now because the other things that we have out there, self-driving cars and stuff like that, there's even a break to music and stuff like that. So. Um, you want to use the Sorry. microphone? Sorry. When you talk about, when you talk about accessibility, you mentioned you want to use and uh, no, if you like I know I work with, but there is uh, part of accessibility which also involves the screen readers or voice overs that you have to go. So you also covered it with automation, or how did you uh, cover that part of? Uh, yeah. So, so the non-functional piece, including accessibility and performance, are, um, and I think this is just how we think as testers. We try to cover that functional part first, and then we think non-functional. Uh, so we, the research project went in that direction as well. Um, by no means is this uh, solving the full accessibility problem, for example. Uh, Axe, even Axe itself, well, the key thing here is that normally with something like Axe, you have to manually kind of traverse and, and get that information, whereas if we have the agents have that capability, then they can do that. But certainly there's a lot more to accessibility testing than what Axe provides, um, but it gives us a quick, a quick return on investment right there to just plug in it, right? So there's lots more to do. Lots in the world of performance, we have a team who's looking at performance test generation and using AI to do that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's by no means any kind of comprehensive solution here yet, um, but there's definitely steps in the right direction. Yes, uh, question here? Oh, yeah, one next, go ahead. Hi, Tarek, thank you for the presentation, it was great. Uh, I just want to emphasize on one other aspect of this AI being involved in software development. So testing in essence itself is reasoning with things. So having some kind of requirements, ex some expectations, and then checking if the application or the system under test is adhering to those expectations or requirements. Let's say that someday an AI or an application set is able to reason with an application without any user input or any kind of training or any kind of implementation itself. Does it also like make obsolete the need for development as well? Just because like if you're able to reason with the application itself and you know how the application should react to certain actions, what bars the AI or the machine itself to make the development itself having access to all the resources of coding and knowing the results of what code pieces does what? Yeah. So uh, it's a very good observation and very well said. Um, there's obviously a correlation between the Oracle problem and automatic generation of code. If you solve the Oracle problem, then you can automatically generate the correct system, right? Um, the key here is that I think, this is what I think will happen. I think that we're, we kind of look at this stuff and testing is ahead of the game and we worry about our jobs as testers, but I actually think our, te our jobs as testers are more secure than the developer's jobs, right? Because what developers do, they, they write an approximation of the system that's not correct, right? Testing tries to verify and validate that is correct. Uh, so that is actually the harder problem to solve. Uh, I can generate something that doesn't work well, right? Or works okay. And AI is actually approximating those things and is actually replacing that portion of the development lifecycle by approximating the function and using data to do it. So I think that that will actually be one of the things that changes first, is how we develop software and that the testers will move from like being kind of like this underdog later on in the process to being like at the front of the process, right? Um, but yes, if, if we could solve that Oracle problem, we could, we could generate the system. It's like, it's the hard problem to solve. Thank you. Uh, over here, we have one here and then one back there. Yeah. Uh, 
thanks, thanks a lot for your presentation. It's really helpful. I think you partially answered my question already. But my question is more about like all the testing that you're focusing, it was more from a UI driven. So it's like that you said tester basically comes into the play like this says. And the testing that we were doing even with AI or machine learning is very expensive because you're literally validating regular expression at UI level. Like have you ever done any project at ultimate software where test things at the right place through AI or machine learning where you have like unit test written through AI, yeah. you have contract test written through AI and then you have UI test written through AI. So that in that way you have a good mixture of because ideally these are the AI driven tests, but I still got a feeling test will fail because of Selenium is not responding. Or whoever to like you are using Apple tool for visual regression, but ultimately yeah. you will be integrating that to Selenium so they can be time off. So I can have one hundred of Selenium tests. Yeah. Distributing those tests at a right level. So so no matter what, uh, you can always have and I, so the, the, the question is really around uh, the reliability and stability and, 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 no, and noting that testing is not just testing from the user interface, right? There's a whole stack of involved in testing from the unit integration and if you're using microservices contracts and stuff like that. Um, so the answer is yes, we have done some work. Um, but, you know, this thing is just about AI just cares about inputs and outputs. Everything else is encoded. It doesn't care that it's a user interface or an API, right? Um, so that's one of the key things that I think is necessary for us to build self-testing systems is to look at that holistically throughout the life cycle, right? Um, any interaction framework, whether it be at the UI level or even at the lower level, can have bugs, right? And at the end of the day, these tests have to be executed, so you have to use something, whether it be Selenium or, or JUnit or, or whatever, to execute these tests, and there can always be issues there. The key to what um, you know, you're asking in terms of my response is that there needs to be more focus at the lower levels, right? There's not. A lot of these vendors are at the upper levels, but probably with the exception of this blue, who's kind of generating unit level tests, which is cool. Um, but there needs to be more work at the API level and the service level, and I think we're going to start seeing it. It's just behind uh, everything else, right? Thank you. Yeah, one more, I guess. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, oh, I can hear it now. The, this is a basic question for, for someone approaching this for the first time. When you have when you're using this AI system to, to generate test cases, I presume that you have to have a tester approve each test to say, yeah, that looks like a test we want to include in our next batch. And if you do that, how do you avoid exhaustion of the tester by generating resilient combinations of keyboard monkey garbage in input? Uh, it's, this, it's the training part of it that's, that I'm, worried about. I'm concerned about. Yeah. So, so very good question, right? So, uh, one of the things is that there is um, there is a little bit of a beast here that we have to try to tame, right? Uh, because um, typically, what you'll see is that the, the training happens up front. System can run all these tests, and there's no uh, there's not really necessarily a limit to what it can run, right? Um, you may want it to to do a lot of testing because you know one thing we know as testers is that we're going to always run out of time. Right? And so we're going to end and we're going to ship and there's some things that we haven't tested and our hope is that we prioritize so that whatever we have tested is more important than whatever we haven't got it to. The key that we've learned here along this journey with AI is that um, a lot of the work that we don't get to do, even a lot of the things like accessibility and all that stuff, is great for these machines to do. And uh, I, I would want to get away from micro approving tests that get run. And more having the system just run and reporting issues to us, right? Of course, um, if an issue happens, then we investigate it, right? But we still have to scale that. But more of, <coughs> hey, you know what? Like, if this system can help us by continuously testing all the time and giving us feedback, um, then the key thing that we need to be able to do is to query the system when we want coverage reports to say that we have indeed cover the system adequately and we're looking for things, it becomes a matter of how do we build systems that allow us to interact, sorry about that, to interact with the AI um, and the machine learning system to tell us what we need in terms of coverage and if it covered it, to, to be sure that it did cover it, right? So there's a whole gap there of how does the human interact with the AI, not only to train it, 
but to understand why it did what it did, right? And 